we have on the panel the previous speakers, Sebastian Paul, uh, Melanie Anderson, and Gabriel Spini. Um, and we have the moderator, which is Greg Wetmore. He's the vice president of uh, product development at Entrust. Um, well, please take your seat and um, Thank you very much, Paul, and first of all, welcome to my fellow panelists. Um, the theme this afternoon has really been transition to post-quantum and quantum safe, so I, I think we're going to at least start our panel with that topic uh, and talk a little bit about different aspects of that transition. So uh, maybe I'll ask my uh, fellow panelists to just introduce themselves quickly one more time for those online who might be watching on video later. Uh, maybe we'll start at the end there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sebastian from Bosch Research. Uh, Gabriel Spini from TNO, Dutch Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Melanie Anderson, Director of Cryptographic Security and Systems Development at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity at the Communications Security Establishment, uh, Federal Government of Canada. Thanks. And that's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> and Greg Wetmore from Entrust. So um, I, I almost can't start anywhere else, but probably the most common question I get from my customers um, when we start talking about this topic, and it's the how do I start, where do I start, when do I start, it's that what's the starting point for me. Um, I think it's probably relevant for all of us to have a comment on that one. You want to start, Melanie? Sure. Uh, there, there are a lot of things to consider. We've heard so much information today and I know sometimes it is really tough to figure out where exactly to start. I think it goes back to you know what Jonathan and I talked about in our presentation, which is evaluate the sensitivity of your data. Understand the data that you house in your organization, whether you are a research organization, whether you're a critical infrastructure partner, whether um, you're an academic. Understanding the data that you have, uh, the lifespan of that data and how it needs to be protected is priority one so that you can make those risk um, decisions moving forward. Um, next, I think, again, we've talked a little bit about cryptographic inventory, um, making sure you have the folks on your team. We talked about <laughs> cybersecurity skills gaps. I could go on. <laughs> uh, understanding where those cryptographic components are within your networks, within your endpoints, um, and all of those systems so that you can start to understand what is that transition going to look like for you is another really important step. And maybe the third thing I'll say uh, is educate yourself, get involved, um, understand, we've heard so much about standards organizations this morning. It's really important to, to understand again, what are the, the areas that are uh, evolving and where can you get involved uh, in those specific standards bodies so that you know where those things are going and that you have a leg up when it is time to start transitioning. So those are the three uh, key things that I would recommend as a first step, thanks. Gabriel? Uh, yeah, well, I, I agree on these steps. Maybe I can add a step zero, which is form a team on the topic. Uh, I will say, if you're part of a PKI consortium, you might not need that, need that, as in you already have the expertise, you probably have formed such a team already. But say, if you have a client of a, a company in the PKI consortium, probably this is all like entirely new and science fiction or uh, unintelligible. So the first step is really forming a team who's going to be in charge for these first steps uh, that Melanie uh, expressed. Sebastian. Yeah, I also fully agree with the <laughs> my previous speakers here, but maybe something to add. So I really like the statement from you earlier that you shouldn't panic now, but start to plan. So this is a really good statement. And also like one more thing there. So n I think NIST has also really done a great job to really bring this community together with having this transparent standardization process. And as a result of that, there are so many like open source implementations already available that you can experiment right away with. So you really can start to get a feeling for mm, yeah, the effects it will have on your environment. And that's quite easy to get started with, I guess. So. Yeah, I, I certainly agree on that last point. There's a surprising amount of capability out there already, even pre-standardization. Um, I know, Melanie, you talked about, you know, it's not really ready for production. I think ev even our solution providers like Entrust agree. Um, but whether you're, you're uh, dealing with commercial uh, products like, like ours, like we heard a bit from Amazon today, we heard, heard from Key Factor, or open source, there's just an, a pretty incredible amount of 
capability that's already available for um, customers and organizations to start learning, start trying in their labs, start trying to understand the impact of their systems um, from this transition. So people in the online rooms are waking up and we have some questions. Oh. <laughs> so um, maybe we can, we can address them to the panel and uh, can you keep your mic on, uh, closed? Yes. <laughs> One of the questions we have is, does Hapkido provide PQC consulting to entities? Uh, actually, not well. Say, <laughs> we're happy to stay in touch. I wouldn't say that we offer PKI consulting. Uh, say, we're not really a business endeavor, so for that, you want to go to other venues. We're happy to stay in touch, but depending on what exactly you want from uh, in terms of consulting, we might not be the right party for that. All right, thank you. I'm going through other questions too, and I'll make them back to some more. I'll look up and uh, make eye contact every once in a while. Um, so where were we? So one of the things uh, we talked about, the theme came out uh, in a few of the conversations today. Um, how do we start building, you know, we're, we're doing it now, but what more do we need to do to build awareness? And how do we drive the level of understanding and knowledge up uh, against the constituents we serve? Sure, go for it, Melanie. This is, oh, hello, it's on. <laughs> Got my handy cheat sheet here. Um, so this is a really interesting question, and I think one that I think about a lot as somebody who's out speaking with CEOs, uh, CISOs, and others uh, from a government perspective. Um, understanding, I think, the, the risk and the sense of urgency, you know, even though our key message was it's not time to panic, it's time to plan, understanding um, this threat and the impact that it has um, on organizations and for decision makers, I think is is the is the first step, and once they understand, that is going to help make the case to compel action to move forward. Um, so I think understanding that issue and helping to communicate and educate it is one of the first things. Um, I think the other thing, uh, again, from a from a Canadian Center for Cybersecurity perspective, is providing that advice and guidance, providing that awareness. Um, we are trying to be out. Uh, public facing as much as we can to spread the news uh, to make sure that people are aware uh, and we're engaging again um, in collaborative activities with critical infrastructure partners, academia uh, vendors, everyone. Uh, and so um, talking about the risks and also the investment, I think that's going to be required um, to ensure um, the buy-in again from those senior executives that are making those decisions is really important. Um, and there was there's one other thought I had uh, and it, of course, escaped me on this afternoon session. My apologies. Um, but I, again, I think it goes back to education, um, getting out there, understanding what that threat looks like, uh, and and helping guide people towards resources that already exist. Again, this, as we've seen here, there there are not many of us working in this industry right now. It's hard to get more people working in this specific domain because it is highly technical. Um, making sure that we're being efficient about that, I think, is also really important, understanding the resources that are out there globally so that we can leverage those and help people understand what that looks like such that we don't have to reinvent the wheel is really important. Thanks. Yeah, one thing I would add here is that, of course, it's important to educate the decision makers in your um, companies or organizations, but I also find it very encouraging that the university itself, they start to already teach post-quantum cryptography in the courses of, yeah, of cybersecurity studies. So this is also like very encouraging to see that the young people, the graduates, graduates that will then come to companies or organizations already really know that topic. So then if you have the combination that your decision makers understand post-quantum cryptography and you get the competencies from new employees or young graduates, then I think it's really good, uh, yeah, a really good way to prepare also for post-quantum cryptography. Yeah, and uh, while I will say we tend to see quantum state cryptography as a purely IT cryptography problem, I will say let's try to involve people also outside of, of those fields. Uh, well, thi this is happening a little bit, I think, so up, to, uh, up to 10 years ago, I think there was only purely some nerds in IT and cryptography who work on that. This is changing, but I think it can change at a faster pace, so in getting outside of a, of a niche, not presenting only as a merely technical uh, problem or try to move uh, to other people. Um, well, uh, 
say in the case of Apkido, the people working with governance on it and specializing in uh, raising uh, awareness on topics with the uh, various tools. You had a couple of points in your presentation, Gabriel, the video game or the, the, um, the video explanation. Like those are um, f uh, formats really that I think speak to some of that, educating beyond just the IT or the crypto or the security professional. Um, we have a responsibility to do that, I think. Yep, hopefully that will work, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, from online. All right, so we have a discussion that's going on. For those who are all interested, be sure to check in the discussions area. Uh, Mike mentioned there is a size limit in the server hello in TLS due to TCP congestion window. Uh, Sebastian from Bosch didn't seem to experience that issue. Could it be clarified what the limitations is and why Bosch didn't hit it? Yeah, I think Mike mentioned this also in his talk today. So we basically ignored that issue with the TCP congestion window in our experiments. So we just let handle the, yeah, let the TCP stack handle the fragmentation. So, yeah, therefore we are kind of trying to let, yeah, ignore that, yeah. Yeah, from the room, Mike. Mike Ellsworth, I guess that question was semi-addressed to me also. So Sebastian, that's an issue. TCP congestion sort of doesn't show up if you're testing on a local network that's not saturated, right? Like that's really an internet at high volume problem. Yeah, so the experience I showed you that, that actually w w the, they were not done on a local network. So we had this uh, notebook and embedded client that was locally in our lab, but then we connected to a remote server that was set up on cloud services. So, but of course it's not a yeah, saturated network. So that's probably why we yeah, didn't experience that issue there. So for so that question, Cloudflare, uh, Boss Vosterbahn has a really nice blog post talking about what happens when you, when you hit the congestion window. And th their data seems to show that the TLS setup time goes from 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. It's a 3X slowdown in the TC TLS setup. So yeah, go look at Cloudflare's blog, it's, it's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Sebastian, since you've got the mic over there, um, you hinted a little bit at this, some of the unique challenges in the world of IoT and connected devices as you're thinking about the transition to quantum safe. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Give us a little flavor of some of the challenges you see out there and s some of the things that you're thinking about with your team. Yeah, so m one thing that yeah comes to my mind there is that you have so many devices out there that will need to be updated at some point. And then you will also have, yeah, this you also have the issue with the limited computing resources available. So you, yeah, need to find some, yeah, good workarounds there, how to make some of these schemes fit into those devices. And yeah, another point I would add there is that, mm, yeah, this, yeah, so for some, of our environments where Bosch is involved in, for example, like automotive ECUs, you also have like very constraints um, about the timing issues. So you have real-time environments, and there you still need to yeah, investigate how you can yeah, achieve those with post-quantum cryptography. So this can also be very challenging. So yeah, this will be yeah tricky road ahead for us to get this to work. <laughs> Anyone else have comments thinking about the world of IT? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I fully agree, and I think everybody who works actually with, with uh, and produces uh, software for IoT systems uh, fully agree. Uh, maybe to name one example, uh, in many countries, if you take public uh, transport, uh, you actually have an electronic car uh, to uh, to uh, check in, say to to pay your ticket, and that has cryptography to authenticate that you're not adding uh, uh, money to that car. Um, uh, while you don't have it. And of course, if it takes now five seconds for the post quantum system to validate your ticket and every uh, single uh, passenger in a train has to wait five seconds with their card on a, on a pillar to, to get in, uh, that, that's gonna be uh, cause troubles. Absolutely, um, and one maybe one thing I'll add on to that, totally agree with, with both of your points. Um, life cycle management of some of these devices is going to be an extra challenge. They are pervasive. These devices are everywhere. They're in people's homes. This is not a traditional organization IT network that we're dealing with in terms of updating endpoints and um, you know software lifecycling and those sorts of things. Um, I think that's going to pose 
an added challenge that we haven't necessarily, we're starting to get there, but when it comes to the crypto that's embedded in these actual systems, it may end up having to be large scale actual hardware replacement versus just updating the software and how are we going to manage that such that we don't have legacy hardware software sitting in people's homes that they're still trying to use and connect that are vulnerable to the quantum threat. Maybe one thing I would add here again, it's, it's also important to be aware of how long the data you send needs to be secure. So because of some, I mean, the good point or one point about these IoT environments is that some of the data that gets sent through those devices or sensors, it does need to be secure for decades. So so therefore you may have, you don't have to yeah, start migrating right away, but you can still pl plan for it, plan for this migration. So yeah. Yeah, it, it came up today, uh, I think, in Matt's presentation, talking about long-term root of trust, um, which is a, a big deal in IoT devices or, or devices that have long in-service lifetimes. Um, I, it kind of brings me to the CSNA timeline. Um, I think the, uh, that timeline showed device firmware as one of the first and leading use cases for quantum safe. Um, maybe you guys can, could comment a little bit on what you think of the CSNA timeline. We've got a pretty diverse national group here, um, and, and certainly that guidance came from the United States. Um, so how do you think about that timeline as a whole, and um, what do you think about those, some of those first use case milestones that are identified there? Yeah, I, I'll start. So I think this timeline is really challenging. <laughs> And I'm <laughs> glad that Bosch doesn't have to stick to this timeline that strictly, because I guess yeah, we yeah more or less have s we have to listen to our customers. So if they request post quantum cryptography in, in the ECUs of some OEMs, then we have to start implementing it. So I mean they set the timeline f for us basically. And but I th I think the approach the and mm, this timeline give is it's. It's good, so it definitely makes sense to start with um, protecting your signatures, your firmware updates with a hash-based signature scheme. So this definitely makes sense, but I yeah I see it yeah, as a very uh, as challenging to get this done within two years from now on. Uh, well, I'm in a very privileged position of being just a researcher, so you know, <laughs> in a way, uh, well, I don't have to uh, d deliver on that. Uh, it does look very challenging to me, uh, indeed. So, in that sense, I'm happy to only being uh, only doing research on this because they do seem like quite a uh, quite demanding uh, timeline. On the other hand, I can imagine if you want to push organizations to move, you don't want to uh, give a lot, a lot of time, right? So, y maybe you can account it to the fact that okay, not everybody's going to be able to, but I can imagine that you you want to give circumstances to be uh, demanding and then maybe be flexible in people not respecting the deadline. And, and maybe I'll jump in, Dad. Like from the government perspective, as we, as we discussed earlier, um, we're working very closely with our partners in the US on this. Um, to note, um, once the NIST standards are published, and you know, as anticipated in, in 2024, um, the NSA 2.0 will be added to the C uh, Committee for National Security Systems Policy in the US. Um, and then the, the NIAP protection profiles, um, which is with all the FIP certifications, will be updated as well. Um, and I, I think the timelines, specifically the focus um, on national security systems, is, is there to, to create that sense of urgency such that anybody who does have um, specific uh, government contracts that they're, that they're supporting really take this seriously and, and invest now. Um, I think we're, we're going to have more time um, than I, I know that the timeline when you look at it blankly it looks wow this is this is gonna be hard right <laughs> noting it, the pace that that we need to change um, but I'll just note again I think from a US perspective at ICMC um, Troy Lang from NSA did note that um, the US national security um, systems um, are planned to be upgraded by, uh, by 2023 2033, excuse me, that's 10 years, yeah, 10 years is a big difference. 2033, um, so there is time, so there is a focus on those national security systems first because there is that, um, when you look at the lifespan of the data, that is a critical component for our entire international community to have those systems upgraded. So I know that from a, from a US government standpoint, at least from my um, understanding of where they're going, 
that is the focus with the CSNA uh, 2.0 first, understanding that the other stuff is obviously going to follow suit, but we do have a little bit more time. So I hope that helps to alleviate a bit of the, we have to get everything done now and we don't have enough resources and enough time. Um, and again, if you have questions about the specifics of those, please don't hesitate to talk to, to myself or Jonathan and we can help clarify exactly what they meant. The, the language, there is some subtleties in it, so it's not necessarily obvious if you're not working within government to how to interpret those, but we're very happy to answer any follow-up questions you might have on that. Thanks. I think we might have a couple from online. Uh, Jeff says, Sebastian, about the Wolf SSL implementation, was a different implementation considered for the performance testing, like OQS, Open Quantum Safe? Um, so we integrated the selected schemes into the Wolf SSL stack, and then we did the performance measurements with, yeah, with the Wolf SSL library. But we, yeah, we didn't compare the performance of these algorithms. Um, yeah, against other other libraries, because we basically reuse the reference implementations of the of the yeah of the PQC schemes and integrated them into into Wolf SSL. And we were more we weren't so much interested into the individual performance of the algorithms, but more or less how they perform in TLS and what this means for the mixed certificate chains approach. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and another question from the chat says, shall we expect something similar to the Quantum Preparedness Act approved by the U.S. in December 2022? If yes, how long will it take to have our own act? Assuming from Canada's point of view? That's what I'm assuming too. I think that's you, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, great question. Uh, what I'll say, um, there are a number of um, number of activities that are happening right now within the Canadian government. Um, unfortunately, none of that is public at this point, but we are looking at specific cybersecurity um, baselines uh, that are required and, and looking at the quantum preparedness timelines as part of some of those particular activities. So um, for those of you who are following uh, Bill C-26 um, that is working its way through government and, and, and parliament, again, that nothing is, is official yet, but um, from a, when we look at baseline cybersecurity controls, um, obviously quantum preparedness is part of um, what we consider cybersecurity. So that's something that we're um, we are heavily involved in uh, from a government perspective. So um, I guess the short answer is not necessarily because the, the Canadian government is um, quite different in, in terms of construct compared to the US government. Um, but it, even though we're not necessarily as public and overt about it, I'll reiterate, we are taking this very seriously and we are working within our government and the mechanisms that we have within government and parliament to, to address and to help create that sense of urgency. So I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe switch gears just a little bit, but on, on a sort of government topic, we heard today from NIST, we heard today from Etsy, we heard today from I ITF, which isn't quite government, but standards. Um, and we've got a couple representatives from sort of government affiliate agencies here. Like this is happening all over the world. We have all of these standards, bodies, and, and governments um, creating recommendations and, and laws in the United States. How do we coordinate this? How do we make things work together? Um, maybe some comments on, on how you think about that challenge. Well, I have to say right now, uh, it seems like a coordination is going quite well, at least from my perspective. I don't have a feeling that there's, say, um, concurrent uh, standard organization pushing concurrent standards. That might change in the future, depending on what happens in ISO, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, indeed, I, I think um, also standards organization organizations have ways to stay in touch with liaison statements. Um, and I see more and more liaison statements going out to coordinate on the topic. So I'm fairly optimistic that will, that will go on smoothly. Uh, but probably here as well, we need to speed up the, the, those connections. Um, but again, so far, I think from my humble perspective, I'm moderately optimistic on the coordination on, on the topic. Yeah, I fully agree. So what I've s been seeing s so far is that the coordination is going quite well, and yeah, there aren't any yeah diff totally different yeah standardization processes going on. So that's a good sign, I guess. 
and I'll jump in with a third in agreement. <laughs> um, I do believe that we are um, cooperating very well. Um, certainly, it, it is imperative, I think, that um, government, industry, academia collaborates internationally on this. It's, it's, it's too complex of a challenge. It's not something that any of us can do in isolation. Uh, and so certainly encourage to that collaboration to continue through international standards organizations, um, through, through events like this, honestly, are, are great ways to bring the community together to ensure that we understand where each other uh, are, as well as any you know research publications, things, again, that we can be efficient with the limited resources that we have internationally working on this. Yeah, I guess I, I, I comment also on adding a bit of positivity as a sort of global solution provider who, who have to build solutions applicable around the world. I think I'm really encouraged by how, you know, I, I think NIST has learned a little bit from past competitions and how, they're, how they ran the PQ competition. And I think that's at the sort of kernel has built this international um, confidence in the direction we're headed. Um, and so I, I'm certainly very encouraged that you know, at, at CN EU isn't going in a totally different direction. Um, and we, we feels more coordinated perhaps than, than past um, from a solution provider's point of view. So I think I agree with the panel here. It, it's been a positive development so far around the world, I think. Yeah. Maybe one example for this as well is, I mean, this hasn't been very public, but in the G7 committee uh, last year, I think, there was also like a small statement in the final report that the G7 nations will also want to work on post-quantum cryptography standards together. So this is also like a very yeah, good sign. So in the room here today, we've got lots of solution providers like Entrust, uh, people who build crypto or hardware security modules or PKI solutions. I'm interested in the panel's point of view on, on what do you think um, you need or what are the most important capabilities um, from those the technology ecosystem as you consider the transition to PQ? Jump in. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I think when we when we look at kind of the, the challenges that face us right now, so understanding, um, again, more from a, a management and business perspective, understanding the data, the risk, being able to um, to look at the specific cryptographic components that exist within our systems and networks is super important. Um, from a capability standpoint, when we're looking at inventory of those components, um, trying to figure out exactly what that looks like. I know there are some, some products that are being developed specifically to look at that to aid in the specific transition. Um, that also comes with risks, understanding that um, understanding where the keys are and the cryptographic libraries that are used. Again, I'm always thinking with the, the, the threat hat on in my, in my role in the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, so without going to specifics, I think lifecycle management tools that have a, you know, a, f a focus on specific um, cryptographic libraries or um, you know, keys, key management, all of those things um, will be really important as part of that transition. And then also, again, when we go back to the cryptographic agility concept, understanding um, products that might help with that specific transition, again, I think is something that I you know, would look to um, our vendors and industry partners to, to really look at what does that transition look like. Um, I will say from a government perspective, um, we never endorse a product um, just because we have to re remain fair and, and transparent and neutral in those situations. But um, I think anybody could, could glean from our presentation, these are the types of things that we, we really are, are looking for. And I know that consumers are starting to look for as they start to plan for that transition. So I hope that uh, helps address your question. Thanks. Yes, well, I, I agree with you. But then maybe something to add is, um, so regarding crypto agility, so there are um, some research works that come up came up recen recently is that s something about like cryptographic agility maturity models. So that would also be something that could help in the yeah s step for preparing for the transition. So that you can automatically yeah assess your systems what kind of crypto agility they provide. So this could also like help you with the plan and with the migration process in the end. And maybe one more aspect, uh, it, I guess it's quite important to um, have a clear understanding of what are very most stringent, uh, stringent requirements for your PKI. Because as we've seen, especially for uh, digital signatures, the current uh, post-quantum standard candidates, 
you don't really have a bread and butter solution that does everything uh, fantastically well. Y you always have trade-offs. Uh, so maybe if you want small keys, then it takes longer uh, to sign and so forth. So it's, it's really important to understand what is the most the crucial part where you cannot, uh, uh, where you cannot have a, a performance degradation and where you can accept to take the hit on other parts of the performance. Appreciate that advice. Thank you. I'm, I'll, I'll take that, in, internalize that for sure. Um, so I, Chris from Key Factor and I had a, an interesting conversation last night talking about um, the, the cybersecurity skill set and the crypto skill set. Chris brought it up in his uh, conversation. Um, Mike, I think, talked about um, the need, need to build intuition and all these dials and knobs that post-quantum uh, as it exists at least today has. Um, and you just brought up crypto agility. I, I think we've got a responsibility, all of us probably sitting here, whether we're a solution provider or a government making recommendations or researchers uh, or technology providers, to make it easy or easier to do the right thing. Um, we can't rely on uh, an individual developer to know what dial to turn, what knob to twist, you know, what parameter to, to use. Perhaps comment a little bit on uh, how you think about crypto agility and how you think um, about your responsibility to, to make post-quantum easier. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think crypto agility in general is like a very broad term and probably every organization or every yeah, product um, department maybe needs to find its own definition that s suits them or fits them. So it, if it's more about protocol agility, then it's something else. If you think about replacing algorithms inside your yeah, your hardware or embedded devices, so therefore I guess you need to start yeah thinking about what crypto agility is for you, and then use the resources that are available to you, and then yeah define it in your own terms, and then start to yeah assess if you yeah if the system yeah has enough crypto agility for the upcoming transition uh, yeah well i have to say uh, i don't have myself a very clear definition of crypto agility but i have a feeling that's a very common thing so from my perspective what's important is actually that we soon agree on a very a much more specific much more uh, uh, concrete definition of crypto agility that might also be something for standards organization but i have a feeling nobody really means something extremely concrete and very precise with crypto agility it, it's it's pretty much for everybody and not very concrete concept and i think that's actually the number one say the next task for us in the list make it uh, universally acceptable and uh, accepted and, and concrete so I agree that the concept of cryptographic agility can mean many things depending on what specifically you're talking about. Um, I will say we do have a publication on our website that talks about cryptographic agility specifically um, with respect to algorithm impl implementation um, such that, um, again, as things continue to evolve and standards are set, if a vulnerability is, is discovered in the implementation of a particular algorithm, being able to move away from that quickly um, is something that we, we talk about in that publication. So it's, I agree, again, if you're speaking at high level terms, it, it could be, you'd be talking protocols, algorithms, in, in general, from a management perspective, because sometimes policies, you know, w if, um, you know, specific algorithms are baked into a particular policy, an IT security policy, um, or it could be larger government policy, that can take w a lot more time. So it's not necessarily just the technical implementation, but also all of the surrounding pieces that I think are really important for that. So I agree. Getting a definition within the community and making sure that we know what the <laughs> what specifically we're talking about in any given instance is, is probably priority one. Um, but just from from my perspective, those are the types of things that we've been talking about um, within Canada and also um, in groups like the... Um, the Quantum Readiness Working Group um, under the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resiliency. It's a topic that's come up as we look at that transition and how do we be cryptographically agile. Yeah, if I can. Yeah, well, please. Uh, I would say there's even more topics and say more uh, concepts for which there's no uh, universally agreed upon definition. 
uh, one thing also if we, think, if we speak of hybrid uh, cryptography, hybrid certificates, well, if you talk to a cryptographer, we'll say, sure, it's a sim. you have two components that is secure as long as one of two components is secure. If you talk to other people, well, no, 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 no. That means that it's uh, compatible with legacy systems, so that you can shut off one component and still be compatible. And if you talk with other people, we'll say, well, it's both. So if, if you use it both, then it's, uh, th then it's secure as long as one of two components is secure, but you're free to, cho to choose that or not. So even there's sur surprisingly many topics and definition for which actually there's no universally accepted definition. And we all think we know what we're talking about when we're actually uh, thinking of different things when we say one, uh, one concept. <laughs> you, bri you bridged interestingly to an, uh, the next topic I wanted to ask about, um, and that's hybrid. Um, I think you can sense from Jonathan's presentation on hybrid, there's, there's some caution from some, some bodies and some, uh, some jurisdictions uh, who are being very, very careful about um, recommending hybrid. There are others like BSI in Germany who've, who've come very clearly out and say hybrid is the only acceptable mechanism, at least at this time, um, for PQ adoption. Um, maybe you could add a little bit about how you're thinking about hybrid, uh, its value, um, my sense is that there is a place and it, it, ha it offers a valuable tool during this transitional phase. Yeah, maybe I'll start here. So I think hybrids are a really good way for starting to protect you the confidentiality of communication. So you can easily integrate the hybrid key exchange into TLS and all other protocols. So I think that's definitely a way to, to go forward and use in, yeah, in the upcoming transition. So so to protect yeah, the confidenti confidentiality of your data in the long term. For, yeah, for PKIs, I'm not so sure if yeah, hybrids are actually like the right approach since we already s yeah, saw today that, I mean, this transition is probably not that urgent already to start with. So here you can maybe wait until we have really mature algorithms and s then start the migration to, yeah, um, to post quantum cryptography with yeah the, the with the kind of yeah, certificates we already know without any hybrid schemes or any additional algorithms so or for example with this mixed certificate chain approach I presented you could start with hash based schemes first and then migrate to um, lattice based at a later point in time so so for key exchange I think hybrid uh, yeah good solution for P guys yeah we'll see. Yeah, I will say say both fields for the, the pro and con of a um, of a hybrid. Uh, they are correct. Uh, I mean, indeed, uh, hybrid has downsides, as uh, highlighted by uh, Jonathan earlier. Uh, but yeah, if you need to uh, migrate very soon, then well, probably it's a very good idea, and that's uh, how the BSI say. I will say it really depends on on, on the PKI uh, y you're looking at. If we focus on PKIs, I mean, if you are sure that uh, that you're everybody using that PKI would be able to migrate relatively soon, uh, say relatively fast then you can probably wait a bit longer and uh, you don't need to use hybrid system. You can just wait to have a sufficient confidence in, in, uh, um, in a given um, digital signature schemes. Um, but if it's a very broad one and you expect people or an organization to take a very long time to migrate so that you expect actually that for quite some time uh, there will be some legacy uh, user in that PKI, then probably you should consider that. So I will say here as well, I, I wouldn't say there's like one uh, solution or one answer for all applications. That really depends on the case. Uh, so I won't go into our position. I know Jonathan did speak to it earlier. Um, but the one thing I would say is I, I think it, it really, it's up to the organization to understand their data and to, to be based on the risk. Um, and, I, and I, again, will give a plug for the, the quantum readiness working group under um, the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resiliency, the banks that are working through this. Um, there was a recent publication that was put out with an appendix on hybrid um, that specifically went through when, when we look at practical transition, what does that mean and how, what are the things that are, are needed to be considered in that particular area? So if you're looking for the specific uh, link to that, um, see me after, talk to uh, Ed Yuskovich just in the back. Thanks. We're getting close to the end of our time slot. Do we have anything else from online? Yes, we have uh, one, two questions in one. Uh, can you share the questionnaire which would allow a company to assess the, its crypto agility status? And does crypto agility have any direct correlation with PKI maturity and agility? If I need to read that over, let me know. There's a lot. Yeah, maybe read it one more time. Can you share the questionnaire which would uh, allow a company to assess its crypto agility status? 
And does crypto agility have any direct correlation with PKI maturity and agility? I wish I had such a questionnaire so I can. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the first part of the question, the questionnaire uh, comes from the, what I mentioned about this cryptographic agility maturity model. So there is one paper out there that has this kind of yeah, framework questionnaire. And I can, I guess, share the link afterwards with the community, if that's possible, to that paper. That would be, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and it's done by the University of Applied Sciences in Darmstadt. Maybe that helps in finding that. And I think the simple answer to the second part of that question, from my point of view at least, is yes, there's clearly a strong linkage between crypto agility and the maturity of your PKI health or, or maturity of your ability to manage cryptographic assets as an organization. I think they're, they're very strongly linked. Thank you. We do have one more, if you're all willing. Do we need a certain type of hardware to implement PQC? That's a very easy one. Uh, well, I'm probably not the best person to answer it, but I will say, well, possibly yes. Uh, <laughs> depends, <laughs> indeed, it depends uh, on what, you, what, what exactly uh, you need to upgrade. Um, but it looks like you won't be able to upgrade all existing systems uh, within the current hardware. And here I'm also leaning on uh, other um, other knowledge, uh, not only on mine. Great. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. It, it, again, a great panel, a great closing of the day.